do is I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of things under the theme of uh, society, I guess, the future of society. And my approach is, uh, takes off from an essay and actually a, a lecture originally that, that Elizabeth Anscombe gave uh, uh, by radio in the late 1950s. And I haven't been able to find a copy of this radio presentation. The title was, Does Oxford Moral Philosophy Corrupt the Youth? Taking on this, this old idea that you know, Socrates, our, our progenitor, was put to death by Athens for, among other things, corrupting the youth. So Anscombe uh, addresses this question, does Oxford moral philosophy corrupt the youth? Her answer is that no, it doesn't, because the youth are already corrupt by the culture by the time they get to Oxford. So uh, at the end of the 50s, she writes this essay on a similar theme. And uh, the essay is called Modern Moral Philosophy. So it's a great essay. It's just, it's, it's a wonderful piece of, of philosophical writing. Um, I encourage you to read it if you haven't. So in the opening paragraph, Anscombe lays out the three theses that she's going to defend in this essay. And this is Anscombe now. The first is that it is not profitable for us to, at present to do moral philosophy. That should be laid aside at any rate until we have an adequate philosophy of psychology in which we are conspicuously lacking. The second thesis is that the concepts of obligation and duty, moral obligation and moral duty, that is to say, and of what is morally right and wrong, and of the moral sense of ought, ought to be jettisoned if this is psychologically possible. Because they are survivals or derivatives from survivals, from an earlier conception of ethics, which no longer generally survives and are only harmful without it. Her third thesis is that the difference between the well-known English writers on moral philosophy from Sidgwick to the present day are of little importance. So what I want to do is I want to start by just talking about how Anscombe frames her view in this essay, why she has these three theses. So her, her idea, and, and I, I think this is, is rooted in, in Sidgwick, her idea is that the, the notion of obligation and of duty in moral thinking makes sense when you have a lawgiver, someone that tells you what you ought to do. But we live in a godless age where there is no lawgiver that we regularly, collectively recognize as having authority to tell us what we ought to do, to give us these laws. And so without the notion of a lawgiver to underwrite claims about what we are obliged, forbidden, or permitted to do, the, the very notions don't get any purchase on us. She thinks Aristotle, by contrast, has a notion of ethics that allows for things like talk of what is just and what's blameworthy without need for a lawgiver. And the idea here is that Aristotle's ethics is founded on a certain conception of what it is to live well as a human being. And once you've got the notion of an organism in play, then you can talk about the things the organism needs in order to live well as that kind of an organism. So plants need water. It ought to be the case that plants have water, you might say. A plant that doesn't retain water is defective. Similarly, we as human beings, if we think of ourselves as a certain kind of animal, maybe a rational animal, well, there are things that, that we need in order to live well as the kind of animal we are. And these are, broadly speaking, the virtues. So her claim then, this is from, from her essay, it would be a great improvement if, instead of morally wrong, one always named a genus such as untruthful, unchaste, unjust, we should no longer ask whether doing something was wrong, passing directly from some description of action to this notion. We should ask whether, for example, it was unjust. And the answer would sometimes be clear at once. So it's clear, uh, it's important that she wants us to give up the, mo the moral notion of ought. So she doesn't think there's anything wrong with talking about what we ought to do instrumentally. So if I want to be in Brumov by 11 o'clock in the morning, I ought to take the train by 8. That's, she doesn't have a problem with those kinds of but she thinks that in the absence of a lawgiver, we, we don't have a coherent notion of what we morally ought or are forbidden or permitted to do. And so her view is then that, okay, I just had something come up. Uh, okay, a bunch of stuff happened. I got an Xbox thing. Let me try to close this up. So her view is that uh, we should 
shift from a conception of ethics that focuses on obligation, forbiddance, and permission to one that focuses on what it is to live well as the kind of organism we are. And so in moral theory, it's, we uh, draw very general uh, distinctions between different kinds of normative ethical positions, positions that tell us what it is to live well or what we ought to do. Uh, perhaps the big three are consequentialist, deontological, and virtue ethics. So the consequentialist position says what you ought to do is determined by the consequences of your actions. So you should do what is best overall for uh, everyone affected by your action. The deontologist says that what you ought to do is determined by certain rules and you should just never violate rules. And you can see how these come into conflict in certain ways. So it may be the case that in some context, I could make you feel better if I lied to you about something. So a consequentialist might say, look, a white lie, the overall consequences of lying for a little thing like, did you like my dinner? Maybe it's better if I just lie. Whereas a deontologist might say, look, we owe a certain respect to people that involves never lying to them. And so a deontologist might say in that situation, no, what you ought to do is tell the truth, even if it runs the risk of offending someone. So deontological consequentialist ethics and then virtue ethics. Those are the sort of the big three that are often pitched in normative ethics. And virtue ethics then goes back to Aristotle, um, which focuses on this idea that what it is to, to live well as a human being involves what it is to exercise our faculties as rational actors, something along those lines. Okay, now how do I get back to okay? Okay, so uh, Anscombe's diagnosis is that everyone since Sidgwick is basically a consequentialist. And according to Sidgwick, the ancients and the medievals looked at ethics as what reasons one has to live various ways and what the wrong, right and wrong ways of living are. But it's only in modern philosophy that we start to wonder what we ought to do and what our duties and rights are. Now, Stephen Darwall uh, advocates a similar position in uh, an interview and then a couple of essays of his. And then Alistair McIntyre, who's responsible for one of the people who's responsible for resuscitating virtue ethics in the second half of the 20th century, uh, McIntyre has a, a similar position. Okay, so part of what I want to do is I want to have Anscombe's criticism of modern moral philosophy on the table. And in particular, that, uh, that those first two theses, that we should, if possible, do away with talk about what we morally ought to do until we get an adequate moral psychology on the table. Because later what I want to do is look at some work in moral psychology and ask ourselves whether or not we've got that picture in view, or rather, to foreshadow, whether they are making the exact kinds of mistakes that Anscombe warned us about some 70 years ago. The other picture, or the other sort of element of the framework I want on the table is Branscombe, Branscombe's, Brandon's reading of Hegel on modernity. And I think Brandon is right about Hegel, and I think Hegel is right about modernity, so I'm just going to present the view. Hegel understands that understands human history as involving one big event. There was one real big event that happened, and it's the transition from an ancient conception of the ethical life to a modern one. On the ancient ethical life for Hegel, there's an immediate identification between the people and the norms that bind them together as a community. There's just no question that this is the way we ought to live, because we are these kinds of people. As a consequence of that immediate identification between the people and their norms, the relationship between the people and their norms is heteronomous, it's other government. That's just simply what I have to do in virtue of the fact that I'm one of these people. Modernity, then, this one big event, involves a transition that breaks the immediate identification of the individual and his, and his communal norms by interposing a moment of mediate, mediated reflection, a question of whether or not this ought to be what I do, whether these norms ought to be the norms that I obey, that then allows for the possibility of autonomy, self-government. Okay, so think then of the contrast between modern institutions like a nation state or a parent-teacher association or uh, a housing covenant, we just take for granted today that the rules that bind a group of people together are binding on them only insofar as there are some mechanisms through which they determine what those rules are. And we think that there's just something wrong with an institutional arrangement that doesn't allow for that kind of reflective government on the part of the people. 
But that was a big difference. I mean, as I say, we take this for granted everything from parent-teacher associations to nation states. But that was a big event in, in the history of humanity. And you can see this. One, ways, one of the places you can see this, this is an example Hegel uses, is the tragedy of Antigone, Sophocles' Antigone. And Antigone is a tragedy for the ancients in a way that it can't be for us. So Antigone, you'll recall, her brother is a traitor to the state, and he's killed. And because it's her brother, she has to bury him. The gods say, you have to bury your brother, give him a proper burial. But he's a traitor to the state, and the state says you can't bury a traitor. So she can't bury him. Now we think this is tragic in the sense that it sucks to be in that position, but it's not tragic for us in the way it's tragic for Antigone. This is a cosmic problem for her. The gods say that she has to bury her brother. The state says that she can't. Now we as moderns, we have this moment of mediated reflection. We think, well, look, it turns out in this case, my relationship with my brother maybe is more important, so I'm going to bury it. Or maybe my relationship to the state is more important. I kind of didn't like my brother anyway. But that's not an option for Antigone. She is faced with this immediate identification of these norms and a heteronymous relationship. Modernity then offers the possibility of autonomy, but it comes with a cost. Once there's a moment of mediation interposed between what your community says is the right thing to do and what you decide for yourself, there's the possibility of alienation. You might come to a point where there's just nothing you think you ought to do. And I think this shows up uh, perhaps most starkly for us in culture today in art. I think a lot of what gets called postmodern art is just wholly within the, the orbit of modernity. It's just the alienation that comes from the possibility of rejecting conventional standards of beauty. So the idea that this is some kind of postmodern movement in art I don't think is right at all. I think it's wholly within the orbit of modernity because it just is that possibility, it's the realization, it's the actualization of that possibility of alienation that is made possible when you have that moment of mediated reflection. Okay, so Brandon sees Hegel as attempting to mark out a developmental tra trajectory of a second big transition in human history, and, and then the possibility of a third stage. From the alienated autonomy that is mediated by modern views of the ethical life to a reflectively immediate form of life and cognition that's made available by establishing a community of trust. So this is the term that Hegel uses at the end of the spirit chapter to characterize the relationship between the two individuals who've undergone this confession and forgiveness, where they each confess that they've done something wrong in some context, and then forgive the other the wrongs that were done. Now, in a community of trust, then, each person is supposed to take responsibility both for what others in the community do and for the unforeseen, but in a sense that Brandon recognizes as difficult to make sense of, intended consequences of their act. And there can be these unforeseen, but in some sense, intended consequences of an act. If we follow Hegel in making this distinction between, on the side of objectivity, the difference between an act and a deed, and on the side of subjectivity, the difference between an intention and a purpose. So here's an example to try to help spell this out. Think of Gavrilo Princep, right? The Serbian nationalist who kills Archduke Ferdinand. When he's put on trial, he says, look, I was not trying to destroy the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? I was just trying to strike a blow for Serbian nationalism. I just wanted free Serbs. So his act was the pulling of the trigger, the killing of the Archduke. The intention, so that's the side of objectivity, the act was the pulling of the trigger. On the side of subjectivity, the intention was striking a blow for Serbian nationals. But the deed that that act came to realize was the dissolution of the old regime, maybe the beginning of even the second world. And then on the side of subjectivity, we can see a purpose that in some sense he has to take responsibility for which is this dissolving of the old regime. So Hegel thinks that a properly postmodern relationship between an individual and his or her community's norms is one where you take responsibility for your acts, but also for the deeds that are, that are the, the things that your acts prove to realize in the world. And not only your intentions, but the purposes that perhaps unknown to you were implicit in what you were intending. And then the members of a community 
take responsibility for those things, even of other members of the community. So I have to take responsibility for what you do in some sense. So how does this work? I love that's one of the things that I sort of have on the, on the back table here is, is how this might look. Because if modernity is a process that takes hundreds of years to work its way out to a point where now we just instinctively take for granted some of what it's resulted in, we shouldn't expect that this second transition would be something that's going to happen overnight. So I think it really takes work to, or it will take work to try to figure it out. Okay, so Anscombe, Darwall, and McIntyre draw attention to the way modern moral philosophy threatens to distort or obscure ancient theories of human flourishing at the cost of no longer rendering them intuitive or immediately comprehensible to us. And for this reason, any understanding of ourselves that we have on the pattern of an ancient virtue ethics would be a reflective one. We have to work our way through where we find ourselves today to get to a point where we can understand ourselves in those terms. Because we don't, for the most part, intuitively present them as live options. We don't think in terms of virtue. One of the examples Anscombe uses is a, a, a judgment that you could just make intuitively without reflection is being unchaste. Now, Anscombe's a Catholic, but the, the idea of chastity is, is not the sort of thing that the most of us sort of uh, resonate with uh, intuitively today. So, taking seriously a virtue ethics for us would require a kind of reflective understanding of it. We have to work our way into that position. And according to Brandon, Hegel thinks modern conceptions of morality will ultimately be superseded by a stage in human history that preserves modernity's autonomy. So we don't go back to a heteronomous relationship to the norms, but we revive an ancient conception of moral cognition as an immediate identification between a people and the norms that allow us to overcome the alienation of modernity. And so what I want to do is I want to look at ancient theories of virtue as a way of effecting that progression, but in the context of some considerations of contemporary moral psychology. So here's the project. And this is so so this this really um, this really came together for me. Uh, while I was teaching a course on moral psychology in the spring. And I knew that I wanted to get the Anscombe essay on the table at the end of the semester. And then we're reading these essays in moral psychology, contemporary moral psychology, and I'm, I'm just struck by how evident Anscombe's criticism applies, how evidently it applies to the kind of work that's coming out of that literature. And, and, and so I'm just trying to think through what the significance of that would be, and then I'm drawing on this Brandonian idea of, of modernity, or Hegelian idea of modernity, as, a, as a, a project that, in some sense, is just a way station between ancient ethical life and something that would be genuinely postmodern. And so now, I, I'm, I'm, I, I see this as something like a, a project, and I'm trying to get other people to uh, take part in this project. Well, part of what I want to do is I want to motivate people to uh, engage in the kind of uh, uh, reflective, critical uh, uh, consumption and, and even production of moral psychology while taking an Anscombian and Grandomian position. Seriously, so I gave a version of this talk a week ago in Genoa, and I thought at, at a conference on virtue ethics, and I thought I was going to have to convince all these people to take the moral psychology seriously, but it, as it turned out, a bunch of them were doing that work anyway. They were familiar with that literature, so that was uh, uh, reassuring, and I'm inclined to think that there really is an opportunity here for, for substantive work. But what I want to do now is just lay out the program as a, as a project and then uh, open it up for discussion. Okay, so here's the idea. We pursue that reflective immediacy of, of uh, uh, an understanding of our relationship, the relationship between us and the norms of our community in terms of a, a virtue ethics, an Aristotelian virtue ethics, and by looking at empirical work on the psychology of morality, which has become a wide-ranging interdis interdisciplinary field of research in the last couple of decades. And these two research traditions offer an opportunity for cross-pollination. My aim today is to outline some of the large-scale structures of a, of a research program and to fill in enough of the detail as to allow interested parties to both appreciate the program's significance and carry the work further. That's the aim. Okay, so a worry. Does my reading of Anscombe and Brandon hang together? I, I think what I'll do is I'll table this. If you're worried about whether Anscombe's advocacy of an ancient ethical conception fits well with Brandon's view that 
Modernity involves an advance over the ancient ethical life. You might think there's a tension there. I think that could be resolved. Right now, I'll just flag it and set it aside. But if there's time, I'll come back to it. If anyone wants to ask me a question, we can, we can look at it. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to look at three cases that I, in contemporary moral psychology that I think support Anscombe's assessment. One involves uh, the case of moral dumbfound, which is used in work by Jonathan Payne and his father, uh, originally, I think it's originally O'Day, but he's uh, a central researcher in this literature, and now there's a bunch of people doing work on moral dumbfound. I also want to look at Cass Sunstein's Moral Heuristics, which was a lead article in Behavioral Brain Sciences in 2005. It also exemplifies the kind of blind spot that I think Anscombe allows us to see. Uh, and then I want to look at Joshua Green's article, The Secret Joke of God's Soul. What's typical of this literature is all three researchers treat consequentialism or utilitarianism and deontological ethics as the two theories to consider. They're each looking at these two perspectives. And furthermore, they each focus on the modalities of permission, obligation, and forbiddance. And there's hardly any attention to what it is to live well as a human being, what it is to be a good person. And so the idea that, that being good is doing what you should, or at least not doing what you shouldn't, right? and that if something isn't forbidden, then it's permitted. That's just the way these modalities work. If it's not forbidden, then it's permitted. And people think, well, look, insofar as you've got a theory like that, if you don't have a reason to forbid something, that means it's permitted. And if something is permitted, it would seem it's beyond criticism. But I want to reject that implication. I want to reject the claim that because something is not forbidden and thus permitted, that it's beyond criticism. I think virtue ethics and focusing on the character of the agent gives us the resources for that kind of uh, uh, position where you can allow that something might in some sense be permitted and still subject to criticism. OK, moral dumbfounding. So Haight gives a bunch of examples of these cases where it seems like there's something that just intuitively feels wrong, but doesn't violate any principles of consequentialist or deontological ethics. So here's something from uh, Haight's essay. Julie and Mark are brother and sister. They're traveling together in France on summer vacation from college. One night they're staying alone in a cabin near the beach. They decide that it would be interesting and fun if they tried making love. At the very least, it would be a new experience for each of them. Julie, Julie was already taking birth control pills. But Mark uses a condom too, just to be safe. They both enjoy making love, but they decide not to do it again. They keep that night as a special secret, which makes them feel even closer to each other. What do you think about that? Was it okay for them to make love? So another case he uses is uh, having sex with a chicken carcass. So these are things that are supposed to be harmless acts, right? The, the case of Mark and Julie is supposed to be they actually think they gain something from. They actually enjoy themselves in some sense as a result of having done this. So they're supposed to be harmless acts that don't violate any obvious rules against doing certain things. And yet people find themselves in a position where they make claims like, I don't know, I can't explain it, I just know what's wrong. And he says, but what model of moral judgment allows a person to know that something is wrong without knowing why? So he uses the inability to give a reason to explain why these things are wrong Along with this research on two-system cognition, the idea that some of our cognition is immediate and unreflective, and some of it involves taking a moment, stepping back, and thinking about what we're doing. So he uses this moral dumbfounding phenomenon, along with this research on two-system cognition, to conclude that we first come to a conclusion at an unreflective or gut level about what we ought to do, and then we search for a justifying reason. So this is the idea of the dog wagging the tail. The emotional dog is wagging the rational tail. Don't let the tail wag the dog. We have this expression in English. Don't let the tail wag the dog. So Pate's view is the, the dog is your emotions and the tail is your reason. The dog is doing something. Your emotions come to a, a gut level conclusion. And then your, your tail, your rational faculties, search for a reason to justify what you've already decided. OK, but notice the framing of this. The very idea that there is a sort of good that comes with a sibling relationship that is special and is irrevocably tarnished by having sex is not even on the scene. So the very idea that you might be doing something that is 
bad for your relationship to your sister by having sex with her. It just doesn't show up. It's either a harm because the consequences are bad, but it turns out there's no bad consequences, no way expect it. Or there's some rule against it, and there's no, again, in the absence of a law that says don't have sex with your sister. There doesn't seem to be any rule that says if they're consenting adults, they shouldn't do it. Or think about the chicken cards, the, the chicken fucker. Right? Well, it's, there's no harm. There's no rule that says don't fuck a chicken. So, must be okay. The very idea that you, you're not living well as a human being, right? That you are engaging in certain activities that are less than ideal for the kind of thing you are, just isn't on the scene. Okay, and again, it seems like, look, insofar as it's not forbidden, uh, forbidden, it's permitted, and so then what's the problem? Okay, Sunstein's moral heuristics. So, uh, Sunstein also, also drawing on this idea that we make these quick intuitive judgments and look for reasons for them afterwards. Well, Sunstein presents this view where we have these moral heuristics that are, are the result of an evolutionary background and a context that no longer necessarily applies. And so we're using these heuristics immediately and he characterized it in terms of homunculus, a small old person who is telling you what to do based on what was advantageous for the species in the evolutionary background, but that no longer applies for us. Now, he ends up making a fairly substantial normative ethical commitment in consequentialism. And I think for uh, the purposes of time, I'll gloss over this. But he, he advances what he calls weak consequentialism. And I think that the consequentialist position that he advances leads him to make certain conclusions that just don't allow, allow him to see an alternative. Even though, as I'm going to argue in some of the quotations he gives, the people he's responding to are making those kinds of distinctions. So again, this is, this is a case where it seems to me our, our commitment to these judgments based on what are obliged, forbidden, and permitted just obscure the fact that there's another way of looking at these cases. Okay, so... Uh, Sunstein looks at Michael Sandel. So he looks at a number of cases, but one of those arguments that Michael Sandel gives against emissions trading. So emissions trading is a proposal that allows for every company or, or organization to be permitted a certain amount of pollution, of emissions. But then you, as a company, can trade your allotment of pollution in a market system. So maybe I'm a big company and I don't get very much uh, permission to pollute because I'm so big. And maybe you're a smaller company and you get more permission. In an open market uh, for emissions trading, I can buy your emissions and then I can pollute more and you can use that money to do something. And so the, the idea is, from a free market standpoint, well, this allows then the smaller company to take that capital and do something with it. And it allows me to pollute more, which if I had to spend that money on, on reducing my pollution, it would be you know less beneficial products or, or whatever. So that's the argument for emissions trading. And Sunstein is looking at Sandel's arguments against emissions trading. So this is, what, what I'm doing is I'll first quote Sandel, uh, Sunstein, and then he's quoting Sandel, and then I'll go back to Sunstein. So this is Sunstein. In emissions tra is emissions trading immoral? Many people believe so. Political theorist Michael Sandel, for example, urges that trading systems quote, undermine the ethic, ethic we should be trying to foster on the environment. And then this is now sent out. Turning pollution into a commodity to be bought and sold removes the moral stigma that's properly associated with it. If a company or a country is fined for spewing excessive pollutants into the air, the community conveys its judgment that the polluter has done something wrong. A fee, on the other hand, makes pollution just another cost of doing business, like wages, benefits, and rent. And this is now Sunstein. In the same vein, Sandel, Sandel objects to proposals to open carpool lanes to drivers without passengers who are willing to pay a fee. Here, as in the environmental context, it seems unacceptable to permit people to do something that is morally wrong as long as they're willing to pay the privilege. So, so this is this is Sandstein's conclusion. It seems unacceptable to permit people to do something that is morally wrong as long as they're willing to pay for the privilege. And his view is, why does it seem that way? Well, it's because you've got this moral homunculus that is telling you, based on what was advantageous in the past, that you shouldn't be doing this, but it doesn't apply in this context. So, so this is Sunstein. I suggest that like other 
critics of emission screening programs. Sandel is using a moral heuristic. In fact, he's been fooled by his homun homunculus. The heuristic is this. People should not be permitted to engage in moral wrongdoing for a fee. You're not allowed to assault someone as long as you're willing to pay for the right to do so. There are no tradable licenses for rape, theft, or battery. When Sandel objects to emissions trading, he is treating pollution as equivalent to a crime in a way that overgeneralizes a moral intuition that makes sense in other contexts. There is no moral problem with emissions trading as such. The insistent objection to emissions trading stems from a moral heuristic. So again, talk of moral wrongdoing, what you're permitted to engage in, there's no moral problem with emissions trading and such, but, but look at what Sandel said. Turning pollution into a commodity to be bought and sold removes the moral stigma that's properly associated with it. If a company or country is fined for spewing excessive pollution, the, company, the community conveys its judgment that the polluter has done something wrong. A fee, on the other hand, makes pollution just another cost of doing business, like wages, benefits, and rent. So Sandel is clearly saying that there is something that we as a community need to convey by not allowing pollutions to be treated like rent or wages. But Sandel doesn't see that. He just sees, well, there's nothing wrong. It's permitted. Why shouldn't it be permitted? Look at the consequences. OK, green on the secret joke of console. So this goes until noon, is that right? Yes. Okay. So You so have 15 minutes. 15? Yeah, 15 yeah, minutes. But I want to have a discussion. Well, it's 37, is that right? Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't, you have another 15 minutes. So you can, I will, okay. tell, I will give you about five minutes when we go to stop and we have Q&A. OK, well, I would like longer Q&A, so I'll try to, I'll try to speak okay. to that. So what I'll do is I'll skip uh, greens. So green also just presents this view as if deontological ethics and consequentialist ethics are the only ones to consider. He has a little passage where he mentions virtue ethics, but it makes no substantive rule in his view. Now, these are only three cases. But these are three cases that are illustrative of the kind of blind spot that Anscombe is identifying in modern moral philosophy. And that means that there's a project here for philosophers who are sensitive to these sorts of things to point out the ways in which contemporary moral psychology is guilty of the kinds of problems that Anscombe identifies. Okay, so let me finish then by talking about some resources for philosophical intervention. Because I don't think moral psychology is entirely on the, uh, on the downward slope. I think they've got productive things to offer. And by way of cross-pollination, let me, let me give three cases of, of some resources for moral psychology that I think philosophers can draw on. Uh, one is on studies of character and virtue. So there actually is some work on this now. In the last 10 years or so, there have been people looking at, at what uh, character or virtue is in moral psychology. The other is moral foundations theory, which ironically comes out of the work that, that Heath was doing on moral life founding. And then the third is the di distinction between dignity, face, and honor cultures. OK. So over the last few years, uh, a body of research in moral psychology has drawn attention to the extent to which our judgments of people and their actions can come apart. So we judge their actions one way. We ju judge them as people in another. So consider consequentialist judgments to sacrifice one to save a greater number. These tend to lead to negative evaluations of the agent, even if we think the act was the right thing to do. So if, you're, if you've got a, 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 imagine a group of people that are on a boat that's going to sink, you know, a life raft, and someone is sick and is probably not going to make it anyway, people will regularly judge that a person who pushes the sick, sick person overboard did the right thing, but they're a bad person. So this indicates that there's some room to make distinctions between judgments of acts, whether they're correct or incorrect, and judgments of character, the people that are engaging in those kinds of acts. Okay, and so, and also, it tends to be the case that people who engage in bigotry of treating certain races or genders or classes negatively are judged worse than people who are just general misanthropes, people who just generally treat people bad. So, from a consequentialist stand standpoint, it would seem like the person who's a general misanthrope is worse because he's increasing negative utility in a broader context. Whereas the person who's a bigot about, say, just uh, people with a different color of skin, they're not as bad from a consequentialist standpoint because they're not creating as much disutility. But people will regularly judge that the bigot is the worst person. So there's something about the judgment of character that's coming apart from judgments of the action. And interestingly, if you ask people, if you do the moral dumbfounding study, and ask them to assess not whether the act was wrong, but the character of the people engaging in it, 
then moral dumbfounding evaporates. People have all sorts of things to say about what a brother and sister are like as people if they choose to have sex, or what a person is like if he chooses to have sex with a chicken carcass. Okay, so Omen and his collaborators have developed what they call a person-centered approach to moral judgment. Uh, so this is from Omen. Moral judgments are frequently influenced by factors that traditional normative models consider inappropriate or irrelevant, and many of these findings would be interpreted as evidence of the error-prone nature of moral judgments. The person-centered approach to moral judgment explains many supposed errors as the outputs of a moral system whose purpose is to determine the moral character of others. The person-centered account can offer a potential theoretical explanation of these findings. Reinterpreting what might be deemed to be errors in moral judgment is reasonable responses given the underlying desire to evaluate the character of others. So we see moral psychology as moving in the direction towards something like a virtue ethics. And also from Olin. In short, there's growing evidence that when it comes to moral judgment, human beings appear to be best characterized not as intuitive deontologists or consequentialists, but as intuitive virtue theorists. Individuals who view acts as a rich set of signals about the moral qualities of an agent and not as the end point of moral judgment. According to the person-centered account of moral judgment, human beings are intuitive virtue theorists who view acts as signals of underlying moral traits, such as integrity and empathy for others. So uh, I think we can see. Tend to think, I think we can see then that our uh, the work in moral psychology is actually moving in the direction that would be suggested by what the philosophers were doing uh, 60 or 40 years ago. So Ansgar's modern moral philosophy led to a, was part of a resurgence in an interest in virtue ethics, and uh, I think we can see that the moral psychologists are now coming around to that perspective as well. Okay. So this then provides a point where moral philosophers can intervene on this literature. They can bring the resources of, morals of uh, virtue ethics to bear on some of this research in moral psychology. All right, moral foundations theory. So uh, moral foundations theory is an approach that Haidt and his collaborators have used to develop a theory of the foundations through which people make the judgments they do. And it's based on a large analysis of um, answers that people give to questionnaires in terms of the kinds of judgments they make about different cases, and then you try to distill a small a number of foundations for moral judgment as can explain a large number of the judgments that people make. And so now there's five or six foundations. Care and harm, so each is a positive and a negative. Care and harm, fairness and cheating, loyalty and betrayal, authority and subversion, sanctity and degradation, liberty and oppression. And it turns out these moral foundations provide support and uh, allow for reliable predictions along a number of metrics. So liberals tend to favor the individualizing foundation of care and fairness. Conservatives emphasize care and fairness, but they also show importance for the binding foundations of authority, respect, and sanctity. Libertarians tend to emphasize the liberty foundation. So one finding that comes out of this, and this is uh, subject to debate, but this is not universally agreed, but one of the uh, conclusions that Haidt suggests here is that part of the problem between the left and the right is that the left focuses just on these individualizing foundations of care and fairness. And that as a result, they think the right, because they don't understand the value, or they don't, they don't without prejudging whether it's factive, they don't see the value in uh, uh, the binding foundations of authority, respect, and sanctity. And so while the right can understand the left, it just disagrees with them, the left tends to think the right is just crazy or moral. So this is one of these places where it seems like social psychology offers an opportunity for an intervention on uh, a live issue today. Uh, yeah, interestingly, uh, liberals tend to be more likely to be consequentialists, and conservatives tend to be more likely to be deontologists. There also is some evidence that uh, uh, frontal uh, lobe brain damage is associated with, with more consequentialist thinking. I, I'm not sure what to make of that, but that's <laughs> something we're kind of found. Uh, also, this is one of these things, just autobiographically, when I was a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh, there, there were, uh, so Michael Thompson was a student of Philip Foote, who was a student of Elizabeth Anscombe. And Thompson works in a broadly virtue ethics tradition. And he used to just inveigh against consequentialist thinking. Just
horrible, there's something corrupt about it. And I never really understood that. But I have to say, I, I feel as though uh, he might have been right. I don't know that I can see it yet, but, but, I, but I think there might be something uh, uh, to it, or at least I can, I can, I can appreciate it one step removed why, why someone might fix it. Okay, uh, the last thing I want to mention then is the, dif the difference between dignity, face, and honor cultures. Now, I'll do this quickly. So, there have been a bunch of research on the ways in which people find self-respect. It turns out these are differences that can track across, that can track across uh, cultures. So, uh, in an honor culture, which tends to, uh, uh, these, are, these are differences that are, are marked in geographic regions as well. So, social psychologists tend to look at Middle Eastern cultures and instances of honor cultures. They tend to look at Asia, East Asia, China in particular as instance of face culture and uh, Western liberal uh, cultures as instances of dignity cultures. So in an honor culture, one's reputation must be defended from insult. In a face culture, there's also an emphasis on the relationship between the individual and society, but it tends to be mediated by a sense of humility and deference to authority. In a dignity culture, on the other hand, there's more of an emphasis on individual autonomy. And so here's a contrast between honor and dignity cultures. Just in terms of their willingness to go to authority and their quickness to be offended. It tends to be the case that in honor cultures, you're more easily offended, but you're less likely to go to an authority to mediate the result. In a dignity culture, those things are reversed. You tend to be less quickly offended and more likely to go to an authority when you are offended. So these are the kinds of differences that might matter when you're looking at, say, people from one culture moving to a region with people of other cultures in it. Yeah, so uh, borderland immigrants in the United States, people from the borderlands of the United Kingdom, Scotland and England, England and uh, Great Britain, uh, sorry, England and Ireland, England and Wales, people from these borderlands tend to move into the Appalachian region of the United States, and social psychologists, some social psychologists, identify that as a kind of honor culture. And so there's these interesting, the Hatfields and the McCoys, how many people have heard about the, this famous feud between two families in Appalachia? So anyway, this is an, another place where it seems like social psychology offers us resources for intervening productively in issues that might otherwise seem outside the bounds of philosophical reflection. Okay, so to wrap up, maybe, maybe let me just mention one thing. So if I had a wand wave over the world, uh, I think it would be interesting to see East Asia as offering a paternalistic notion of enlightenment. So we think of enlightenment today as this period that emphasizes individualism and autonomy, the right of the individual to decide for him or herself what rules to live by. That's typical of a dignity culture. But in a face culture like China, you have much more of an emphasis on the relationship between the individual and society. And one might think that Western enlightenment is characterized by a kind of individualism. You might wonder whether a genuine counterpoint to Western notions of individualism could come by way of a paternalistic enlightenment, of the sort that may be something like communist China would offer. And that's not endorsing the political system in China. But as we look hundreds of years ahead and we think about what things might be, that might be an interesting thing to juxtapose against Western notions of the enlightenment and modernity. All right. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end there. I'm open to questions. As I said, it's a big project. There's a lot of moving parts, but my hope is that you found this stimulating and, and worth thinking about. So thank you. Okay, so we thank you for a very interesting talk, and now it's time for Q&A. Now, the way this works is I will choose students first, and then I will choose the other people, the faculty and teachers as well. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will give you the microphone. So, are there any questions? No questions? Okay. If you want to spend, if you want to spend 10 minutes clapping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I came late, but uh, you mentioned something about, uh, about the fact that People flock from right can understand people from left, and left just thought about people from right that they are they are ruling the one that is. So can you explain to me this fact again? Yeah. So, so, my floor, so this is one of the things that, that comes out of this work on moral foundations theory. And again, this is not universally accepted by everyone. Even the people working on moral foundations theory, this is not universally accepted. 
But so here are these five or six foundations. Recently, they've, they've added the sixth, the Liberty Oppression Foundation, to try to make sense of the libertarian, political libertarians. But the, the five core ones, the Care, Harm, and Fairness Cheating Foundations, are, it turns out if you identify as a political liberal, you know, you vote Democrat in the US, you emphasize those foundations. As you're answering questions on this questionnaire, they've been coded in terms of the foundations, you tend to emphasize fair, uh, fairness and care. And you tend not to emphasize things like sanctity or authority. Like, sanctity is going to be the kind of thing that might motivate someone to say that the chicken fucker is just wrong. And there's something degrading about that. And, and as a result, it's, it's, it's wrong. Or, and you might think the same thing about the case of the brother and sister. Uh, people on the right, on the other hand, so I think people who vote Republican in the United States, people on the right show a more balanced appreciation of all five foundations. So they will also make judgments that reflect sensitivity to a value of, of sanctity, authority, and loyalty. Again, without judging whether or not they should, you know, not, this is not a normative claim that it's right or wrong, but just descriptively, conservatives tend to balance uh, their concerns across all five foundations. So one of the features of contemporary political life that this is supposed to explain is the tendency of the left and the right to engage in asymmetric disagreement, where the left demonizes the right as just being you know, fascists or Nazis or, or horrible people, and whereas the right, the story is supposed to be, and I'm not endorsing this myself, but the story is supposed to be that the right understands the left and just disagrees with it, whereas the left just finds the right's uh, uh, commitment to things like authority and, and loyalty to be evidence of fascism or something. Any more questions? Anyone? Okay, so to give you some time, I have a question I would like to ask. So in this presentation, you sort of feel like on the concept of the community, right? And I'm familiar with Blandon, I know with Blandon it probably means like a linguistic community, right? But I would like to sort of like to ask you, like, aiming in this direction for the future of more virtue, right? What all sorts of things should this idea of community, like, include? Right? Because the in this presentation you sort of you went against you know, consequentialism, you know, as you said, most most ethicists today are more likely to be con consequentialist or not, or at least that's what uh, Aspen was claiming. Right? And the people who are for consequentialism, like those people, for example, like uh, you know, they care for animals and those kinds of things, and they see it as a good progress in that, you know, like the ontology ethics do not tell us much like right? how we should deal with you know animals or you know maybe in the future artificial intelligence, you know, me that's what I'm interested in, right? So I would like to sort of, you know, try to demarcate, like, what in, what for you should, like, this concept of community involve, right? How should we should develop it? it? Like, should it extend to animals and... Well, and maybe, right? Or should it not? Like, or should we, like, just, uh, should we, like, allow all rational beings or something like that? Like, I want you to demarcate the area. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm leery of, of wading into to first order issues in part because I don't have a settled view. I mean, I'm a meat eater, so uh, I, I don't in general think there's anything wrong with, with eating meat. Uh, now, are they members of the community? I mean, in some sense, but not in the same way that, like, my duties to, to you outpace my duties to, to non human animals. But then I think that's true even of relationships closer to me. So, so my duties to my family or my girlfriend outpace my relationships, my, my duties to you or other people. So I'm willing to see them as part of the moral community insofar as we recognize that there are relations within which, or relations with groups that are more significant. And uh, I mean, my own inclination is to put animals as far as they're in the community at all at the edges. Uh, but but I, 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 I'm a particularist about this, and I don't have a settled view about much with regard to anything tolerably uh, complicated in ethics, and I'm uh, an inveterate optimist about the ability of people to engage in unfettered conversation and try to decide for themselves what to think. So I'm willing to defer to people who's, who have given it more thought, and as, as, long as, the, as long as the conversation remains open. I found it interesting that you mentioned family members because a lot of people take their pets to be like parts of their family, right? So a lot of people would like put their animals like 
yeah, that's part of my, that's my family. I'm taking like the human. These days, people can take them to like populations, you know, expensive populations yeah. before, but I don't think so. And I'm, you know? I'm, I'm open to that as well. I mean, it may be the case that my relationship to my dog is, uh, in, in re puts me in a position to, to be obliged, I don't know if I, I can use this word given what I just said, to be obliged to have a, 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 a connection to that animal in a way that um, is more significant than my relationship to a person who I just don't know. Okay. So, anyone thought of a question? Students? Anyone else? Okay, you have a question now. Yeah. Have you been using white lie? By telling me that you like the dinner I cooked for you. No, no. Yeah. And there I'm a deontologist, I would say. Have you used the white line now? No, okay. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. Okay, I'm so yeah. I didn't think we we're going to be solving family feuds here, but <laughs> that's close. That's a good place to be. Okay, so since we have plenty more time in the QA, I would also have one more question. Sure. Right? So here you appeal a lot about, you know, that uh, moral psychology can tell us a lot about people's moral intuitions, right? But I can imagine that like ethicists or maybe a consequentialist, like you people tend to be a lot of rationalists or intellectual people, they might tell you, look, yes, people have a lot of like moral intuitions, right? But not every intuition is a correct intuition, right? We should not follow our intuition just doing it, right? No, I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's natural as well. Right? So what should you say to this textbook like, sort of objection? Right? What, is it, what is the exact thing that like, the moral psychology can add here? Right? No. We're talking about ethics. Well, I, I, I'm not sure about moral psychology. So maybe I didn't understand the question. It's no part of Aristotle's virtue ethics. It's no part of anybody's virtue ethics. That what you, uh, you know, intuitively judge in any particular moment is going to be appropriate. Right? Aristotle thinks that you should uh, imagine the phronomos, the practically wise individual. What would the practically wise individual do? In the U.S., we have these bumper stickers: WWJD. What would Jesus do? I mean, we put ourselves in the perspective of the person whose views we admire, and then we think about what we ourselves would do. And, and as you know, working on shared intentionality, I think that's a that's a deep feature of what we are. We live these shared lives, and, and it's and so it's baked into the view that you don't simply indulge in whatever your intuitions are. You know, it takes practice, it takes work. But I felt like maybe that wasn't addressing your question, so. Mm. Maybe it would be more interesting for me to clarify what is then the role of moral psychology you think that can help us here and clarify what is the moral virtue, right? Because I don't exactly see the connection yeah. here between, you know, what Aristotle was talking about, right? This immediate sort of view of you know, what morality is, to this more immediate view of what uh, that you can try Yeah, to okay, okay. So I, I do not think that the moral psychology offers us much by way of first order moral judgments. So I, I'm, I'm not, my view, my view is not that study the moral psychology in literature and you'll be a better person. You might understand what it is to be a better person in terms of the kind of cognition that goes on in that, right? It turns out it's plausible that we make judgments of character and not just judgments of acts. Maybe we learn something about what we are descriptively once we study that literature. But that's not to say that it's going to teach us anything about what the right judgments to make are. So I, I, I'm not looking at the moral psychology as offering us prescriptive or normative claims about what we ought to do. Instead, the thought is, insofar as we're interested as moral philosophers in what we ought to do, we ought to have a good moral psychology. I, I think that's Anson's point in modern moral philosophy. In the absence of a lawgiver, talk about what we ought to do just doesn't make sense. So until we have an adequate moral psychology, we should give up this talk entirely. What I found interesting is that this moral psychology literature is engaging in this consequentialist deontological framework where they're using these obligation forbiddance and forbidden, uh, uh, permission and forbiddance, and they're ignoring virtue ethics. And so that just strikes me as a place where the philosophical literature and philosophers can intervene and, and maybe make help the moral psychologists make some progress on the descriptive side, but I'm not confident that there's a lot of normative or prescriptive conclusions that the philosophers are then going to drive that. But that isn't to say the research is going to be pointless, because again, if you, if you want to have a view about what it is to live well as a human being, you've got to have a view about what it is to be a human being. Well, thank you for that. So we will have time for one more question. So, ah, we have a question now. I have just a technical question. I'm interested about uh, you said that uh, 
the postmodernism is some kind of equivalent of uh, modernity or modernism, right? If I in in right. art or so uh, I use art, yeah. 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 So I my claim is that what gets called postmodern art is just the alienation characteristic of modernity. It's just modern art run to its end. Yeah, exactly. And this is uh, something uh, what you can find in, for example, oh, not for example, only text where I found that uh, conclusion or this kind of thought it was uh, uh, postmodernism, cultural logic of uh, late capitalism by uh, Frederick Jameson. And I'm interested interested if you use it as a source or it's your own uh, idea. This is just my attempt to make sense of things like the banana tape to the wall in our face or Duchamp's toilet, right? Like, maybe this is art, but it's not beauty, so where did we go wrong? And, and it seems like the Hegelian notion of modernity is involved in its mediated reflection that gives us the possibility for autonomy, but also puts up the possibility for alienation. What would alienation look like in art? It would look like a banana tape to the wall. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, and I'm not familiar with that essay, so I, I'll, I'll bug you for, for the citation after. It's a great to say. Yeah. <laughs> I'll thank you very much for your answer.